Hello, I'm Jamie. I'm Vanessa. And we are Low Key Obsessed. So today we are going to talk about all the things that you go through when you're searching for a new job, um, like how to set your resume apart, just like all kind of like the key to successes for like accelerating your career. So yes. today we have Paul. So Paul, I'll get you to introduce yourself. So what's your background? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Dillon. I've been in HR for 15 years now. Um, how did I get into HR? I actually kind of stumbled upon it in university. I was always a big math nerd okay. and I'm just like super extroverted as well. So I'm like, how do I blend? I don't want to be like doing like An a engineer. math finance type job. Yeah. Yeah. And I love people. And I love working with people and solving problems. So I thought HR is like the perfect career for me. Okay. And I've been able to focus spe specifically in the area of compensation in my career. So I get that hit of numbers, which I really love and enjoy, but also working in HR and then working with people. So it's the marrying of the two things that I like to enjoy the most. That's so cool. I wouldn't think HR numbers at all, to be honest, but maybe that's because I'm not that familiar with HR. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know. think that either, actually. But that is really cool. Um, so what, like when you are like screening for new talent or kind of like recruiting, like what's the things that you like usually look for? Great. That's a great question. So I think over the years it's evolved. I think if you went back in the day, it was about, does someone have the technical skills for the role that you have? Yeah. But I think as time has gone on, that's almost like bare minimum table stakes. Now it's really about the the soft skills, right? It's yeah. about problem solving. Are you a great communicator? Are you easy to work with? Are you coachable, right? So whatever individuals can do these days to really highlight that, be it in their LinkedIn profile, be it in their resume, or when you have conversations, right from that first conversation with the recruiter to the hiring manager, that's really what's gonna separate you apart because we are really looking for people that are gonna be a good fit yeah. and are able to um, work because you know we as humans, we're complex and the ability to partner and work and collaborate is a lot more important. I'm not saying the technical skills aren't, totally. but if you just have that, yeah. like you need to have a mix of both. What's your 100%. interview style? Like when you first interview someone, like what's your style? Sure, I, I definitely try to have the candidate do like 80 to 90% of the talking yeah, okay. and a lot of listening. And, and I think my job as the recruiter is to really focus on just asking probing questions and diving deep because what you really want to understand is, is that, okay, can somebody share with you their experience, their background, or some of these soft skills and specific examples. So, you know, that's usually the approach that I take. And then that conversation can go in multiple different ways. And I definitely think that's how you really understand yes. um, how someone works in different situations. So you don't ask the generic questions like how, what people used to ask back in the day, like what's your strongest? Or like my worst favorite question yes. is like what's like your greatest area of opportunity, like basically like your weakness, because like everyone knows that you're supposed to like change your weakness into like a positive and be like, oh, I just like pay too much attention to detail. Yeah, but like, like generic questions. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, do you use any of like, cause I know I've been like in an interview and they like ask like the, there's like a manhole question or there's like all these like weird kind of like, how do you think questions? Like, do you feel like that works or it's like something that you do? So it's, it's interesting, right? Because don't in the company I'm in right now, like yeah. we still use those questions, right? Like what do you value in a company? Mm -hmm. Um, et cetera. Like, you know, you know, what's the, the type of leadership style that you totally. like? I, I think they serve a purpose, but like, I think what you really focus on is, is that, you know, when you, when you talk to someone, it's how they communicate, what's their problem solving skills. I think is that ties in so many different aspects of, you know, really what is their skill set for the role, but also in terms of what their thought process is. Right. Totally. And that's so important. And I definitely think, you know, if there's one area I would focus on is the ability for people to manage projects or tasks and i think um those questions and the answers to those are a lot more important than like w you know what's the one area you can work on because the reality is when you make a decision i've seen in my career that really doesn't come into play so i just feel totally. like it's been like a standard question to be asked but I think you really want to be focusing on stuff like agile thinking skills, which is so important because things pivot so yeah. quickly today. Yeah. And I think a lot of people use like the star technique. It's like yeah. situation, tactic, action. Why are you results. laughing at the star technique? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no. Do you do that anymore? Yeah. Is that 
<laughs> uh, like, I, I really hope we can move on from that. I right? hate really? this Star Trek oh, yeah. thing. Like, like, it, it, like, I hate it. Because especially, I've interviewed a lot, actually. Like, I've actually really struggled. Like, because yeah. especially, like, when you want to get to, like, the next step in your career, they'll be like, what's your experience in managing a team? And you're like, oh, I have to, like, really pull from, like, personal examples or like other things that are going on because like maybe I just have one direct report so it's like hard to be like I didn't really manage a team but like I could do it yeah but like you're trying to get to that next level so it's like how do you really like make yourself stand out if you like kind of have the skill set but like you're not 100% there yet I you know it's it's, it's funny right because like first impression is so important really and oh it, it definitely is and like I'm a big believer make a good first impression and continue to build upon that that's going to really make you stand out and once again you know star technique or or you know basically you know behavioral question interviews yeah. all that stuff that's been done in the past that's great but what you're really trying to understand when you ask these questions is thought process mm -hmm. and that's going to like and really like critical thinking critical thinking yeah. skills problem solving skills right so i think i think if you can really focus on that that's what's going to make you stand out. So right from the beginning, you that first question, you want to make sure that you really have a strong answer in terms of your thought process of how yeah. you approach it. Because that's what recruiters are really looking for in terms of, okay, is this person going to be a right fit for our organization and that role? Do you know that's so funny? Vanessa asked me that. <laughs> she was like, is it like dating where you just know? You're like, you go into it, you're like, nope not a fit so do you feel like you anyone's win you over or you feel like it is really just like putting your best foot forward right off the bat i think we as human beings we are you know like our biases can come into play when it comes to like perception is reality yeah. etc and, and i think the way that we operate is someone that makes a very strong good impression from the moment they walk in and that first opportunity to communicate with you positive or negative I think, unfortunately, like some bias can come in play and we as recruiters really got to take a step back. Right. But I really do think if you can start strong and continue to build from there, you're going to walk away and what ends up happening, you leave. And if you're doing an interview with someone else, you debrief and you're like, wow, that was such a great interview because that impression is on top of your mind. Yeah, right. you know, that makes sense. So circling back to like when you're screening candidates, yes. like you mentioned like a strong LinkedIn profile, like are you looking for a lot of recommendations, just like a very thorough outline of like what your career, like your duties and responsibilities are, like what kind of makes, or like lots of connections, like yes. what kind of wins you over? Yeah. And or a good profile, like yeah. now you can add like the header photo. <laughs> yes, exactly, right? So I think first and foremost with LinkedIn, there's different sections from your headline to your summary to your experience, as well as basically um, uploading media of any projects you might have worked oh, yeah. on. So I look at it like, ignore the vanity metrics, right? Same thing with Instagram. What do people think? How many followers does somebody have? How often are they engaged? How many likes they get? Yeah. Sure, that's an indication, but I, I would believe that you're better focused to whatever niche area you're working in, doesn't matter what industry, what you do, understand that industry, understand that audience on LinkedIn. So it comes from what are the keywords to use? Because okay. the algorithm is gonna pull based on that. Totally. And when it comes to content, I'm a big believer that when you post any content, if you decide to do that, respond to every individual. Oh, and it's not just like, a lot of people just say thank you, thank you, yeah, or yeah, just totally. like. No, if someone posts a comment, get an engagement. Why that's super important? Because I would say version one, and, and Vanessa, you and I were talking about this before, is like resume, have a strong resume, talk about yeah, those skills. Right. Version two is you gotta have a presence on LinkedIn. I think version three is, is start building a community and basically you'll know your target audience based on whatever industry or any location you work in, yeah. have those conversations. Then what's gonna happen is you have the double effect of having a strong LinkedIn profile and when opportunities come up, if you're within your industry, people are going to think about you're going to come top of mind when they're looking right. for the role. Exactly. Or if someone from a recruiter doesn't know the industry is doing a search, they're going to be able to see, OK, your name will start popping up in terms of other people's profiles are commented on. And once again, that's going to bring you to the top and probably have a recruiter. I probably want to talk to this individual. I don't even have a LinkedIn. <laughs> I think I tried to add you. Yeah, but it's like, I don't even, I don't even use one. I barely. Oh my gosh. I'm um, so behind. Yeah. Get in there, Vanessa. What are you uh, thinking? Yes. I don't know. That's why I'm just like bringing around my paper resume to everyone. Oh no, my gosh. I would never. But. Um, when I was in university, it was like a big thing that like, cause like Facebook, this is how old I am. <laughs> Facebook came out and then everyone's like, oh, don't post the photos of like you with solo cups at the bar. <laughs> and then it like became like 
like I remember I was talking to my friend and he was like, no, you need to see your social media to like show like your personality and like the hobbies and all those sort of things. So I used to have like a private Twitter and he was like, who has a private Twitter? And I was like, I don't know. I'm locking it down. I want like employers to be like, oh, she tweeted about this or whatever. So like I had everything private and then I had to like open it up. Like, do you ever look at people's social presence to like see if they're a fit for the culture? Yeah. And and I definitely think, you know, in terms of things you want to do and you don't want to do, doesn't matter if it's LinkedIn or if it's Instagram or any other social media is, I believe we are all, we're our own brands Mm -hmm. and your brand is so important. I equate that to your grade point average. You work so hard to get, you know, like a certain grade point average. One screw up can drop you down so hard to bring it back up. It's the same thing with your brand. So I believe in terms of you know, the how you live professionally and personally. People can say, I've got my own professional social media account, my personal account. I think it's very difficult to live double lives. I think it's like intertwining with each other. So in terms of like, I would agree, are people going to search? They will. They're going to look for things that potentially are going to be like, I don't know if this person going to be a right fit. So you just got to be very mindful of that. I truly believe people should be authentic and live their authentic lives. Mm-hmm. But also understand if I'm working in, let's say, public relations, You know, if you're basically constantly showing up and you've got things that may be perceived as, you know, not what you would see consistent with that industry or the profession you want to choose, it could work against you. But vice versa. It could work for you. For you as well, right? So that's where you gotta really understand, you know, what your brand is, how do you wanna put yourself out there and do what's comfortable for you. Like to your point, but that's I wasn't on LinkedIn several years ago either. And to me, it was just all about it was really overwhelming. And I talked to a, a colleague and he was much younger than I, and he just said, just get started. Right. Just start small because if not, you're gonna be always feeling overwhelmed and just not do it. Yeah. And the price you pay, you know, every six months I go and not do it is like six months less of building your presence and your brand online. Okay. Well that makes sense. Yeah. You're gonna get started. I need to figure out my present, my brand. <laughs> yeah. How do you figure out like if you wanna build your personal brand, would you kind of like Cause like I've done this with like coaching in general, where you figure out like your core values. Like, would you say that it's like your like key strengths? Like, okay, like these are the three things I excel at. Like, I want to really demonstrate this in like my LinkedIn and like my resume and like make sure it's like consistent. Cause like you, I used to hate this actually. The LinkedIn had like I don't know, it's skills or whatever. Yeah. And then like your friends could be like, you have all these skills. And then you have like a hundred random skills where it's like event planning, keyword, I don't know, SEO, like all yeah. these random stuff. And you're like, this person doesn't know that I can do this. They just like added it on. And I read somewhere that you're supposed to like remove them and just choose the ones that like you actually like are your strengths. Yeah. And, and that's really difficult, right? Just having people vouch for your skills. It's just basically, you know, it might say, 80 people yeah. says that Paul's great at communication. So what does that really mean? I'm a big believer of really know what your purpose is. So I've got, you know, some colleagues, you know, some, you know, um, mental health is really important to them. So they're really focused on their purpose of really um, accentuating, you know, mental health in the workplace, right? So everything that they do funnels up to that. So I'm, I'm really believing organizations yeah. are really purpose-driven now and they're looking for purpose-driven individuals. Oh, and I think for individuals, in terms of building your brand and your presence, everything you do, really understand, I would say more so than what are my top three skills, what are the top three things that are most important to me mm-hmm. in terms of you know my professional or personal life? Or like volunteer work, whatever or like that social cause, or whatever. Exactly, totally. right? And then basically live up to that, right? Because that is what will shine through and that's what's going to make you stand out in what I mentioned before, whatever niche area that you want to work in. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So switching gears, yes. you've got the job. Yes. Now you feel like inflation's going crazy. Vancouver is an expensive city. Like how do you ask for a raise? That's a great question. So I work in compensation. So I work at Hootsuite, helping them determine like what our pay should be, what's market competitive, always getting questions. What are our salary increases? Are there going to be inflation, cost of living increases, right? So things are, are, are rising in terms of cost, and that's really bringing pay to the forefront for individuals, right? Yeah. So I think there's a few key things you can do. It's not advisable just to say, ah, the costs are going up. I need to go ask for a raise, right? Yeah. I'm a big believer of the raise should come as a natural consequence of what you're doing leading up to it, right? So mm-hmm. it would be as it's like, okay, if you've been working in a role for a certain period of time, you know, step up. 
work in some other areas because that may open you up for like, you know what, we can expand this person's responsibilities. That is more justifiable from a business perspective to get an increase or you know what, this person now is promotion eligible, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer is, is that do things that are going to demonstrate that you add value to the company and the company will basically then say, okay, when we're looking at rewarding individuals, who are the true value drivers that's going to not only get a raise but hopefully get the biggest raise but also understand and balance that with company budgets may kind of come into play totally, yeah. so then you're in that teeter-totter right but i'm always a big believer is is that keep your performance keep your value what you're willing to do grow because that's going to pay in space with the current company that you're with mm -hmm. or potentially with a, a, another employer so i'm a big believer is focus on yourself and, and create value and develop and grow and the pay will come. So to get really tactical, yes. so you like took on all these new responsibilities, you see that you add value, let's say it's like six months have passed, you really feel like you've reached a new benchmark, like how do you broach that conversation with like your manager? Okay, I can actually share a real life example. Yes, yes. It happened at my previous company, one of uh, the employees on my team took on extra responsibility it was not only doing compensation but helping with benefits redesign work so the individual that was not part of their scope they did all that work and they basically were did a tally of here's what i saw as potential areas of change we can do mm -hmm. here's what it's going to do in terms of impacting the experience for employees using those benefits as well as cost savings by going to other providers and said by me doing this it led to the company saving x amount that's tangible there, right? So to okay. me, it was very easy to go to my boss and saying, if we would have continued as is, we wouldn't have been looking in this area. This individual not only gave us better benefits for our employees, but saved the company annually close to 50,000, whatever that number was. Yeah. Let's reinvest a percentage of it into them, yeah. through, into a one time bonus for the individual. Oh, so that's a really tactical, great example, which is well, if you're going to do something that basically um, tactically, I would say, Focus on something that's going to have great impact to the business yeah. and, and basically share that of what you did and what the outcome was. Right. That's a very good value play to uh, potentially get a yeah. salary increase or a bonus. Yeah. I guess it's also easier when you can like show money savings or like increase in revenue. Like sometimes when you don't have like a role that like directly affects the bottom line, it can be like a little more challenging. But there are things you can do. And, oh. and um, you know, from an operational perspective, it could be helping in terms of process refinements or efficiencies, removing frustration. Yeah, so I want to be clear, it doesn't matter what you're doing, value can be defined so many different ways. Oh, so interesting. I, and, 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 you know, we as humans, we naturally gravitate towards organizations or individuals that deliver value. It's no different than if you look at friendships, right? What yeah. friendships grow? It's someone that will basically you know, ask you a lot of questions to get interest in your life and they help to support you achieve your goals. That's a demonstration of value, right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm a big believer. I, I do get that question a lot. If it's not like money focused to show potential savings tangibly, like what else can I do? Right. But yeah, value totally. can be defined in a lot of different ways. Oh, that makes sense. Interesting. Do you feel like you're learning a lot? I do. I'm so like, oh, this is very interesting. Stuff. I am. So at work, like how do you, are there things that you do to kind of like create kind of a better working environment? And I know a lot of companies have like new initiatives. Like I know there's some startups that they don't have vacation days and it's like you can just take the day off if you don't have work and they don't count it as that. Or like they have like lunches on Wednesdays or like beer Fridays. Like there's all these new like kind of things that are supposed to like contribute to like a better kind of like work life. Is there certain things that like you found in your experience, like people value and like what, I guess like it depends on the person, but like what they candidates like attract them to sure. the company. I, I would say right now, so we did a employee survey at Hootsuite yeah. in the first quarter of the year, you know, we're kind of coming out of the pandemic, remote working people at, at Hootsuite were saying we're feeling burnt out. Yeah. We're feeling like, you know, a lot of work related stress. And the number one question where there wasn't a strong score is, can I disconnect at the end of the day so I can relax and recharge? Ooh. We didn't have a high score, right? So when you look at all these cool things that the tech companies are doing around town in terms yeah. of, you know, trying to follow that Google model and set up like really cool office space with food and way for people to connect, et cetera, like that's all great. But what I really realized that really resonates with my team is, can you really be authentic with that individual and show that it's okay 
to, you know, not always put on this face. Like I'm at work and I have to be like, go, go, go. Right. So I, for example, like uh, two weeks ago, I told my team, I told my boss, I woke up this morning feeling stressed out. I need a mental health day. So coming yeah. from like the leader, it all of a sudden opened up conversations about what people are feeling. Oh, what's important? What do you value? And, you know, one of the individuals said, you know, I don't have enough time, you know, to spend with, you know, with my daughter. Right. So I said, hey, if you need to take time off, do that. You're working yeah. on the clock. I don't care when you start. I don't care what you finish. Yeah, for totally. somebody else, it was, I really want to take a vacation. And it took for me just saying, you work and you send me emails sometimes like 11 at night. No, you're going. Totally. The work will still be here. So yeah. they, they, they didn't feel comfortable. So I think it's great for company to do all these initiatives. I'm a, I'm a big believer is that individualize it and understand what's important because what's important to one person is not going to be important yeah, to like somebody some else. Some people right? like more vacation days, whereas some people like they're not wild about vacation, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. And they'd rather get paid more. Or you have other people that are just like, I want to connect with people. So like I met up with a, a few coworkers outside of my direct team mm -hmm. and we just meet up just to go for a walk or go for, you know, a bite to eat, whatever that might be. Because people are just like, I need to connect with people because I'm just working from home. Right. Totally. Where I'm so used to that hang up and getting changed. And, and yeah, and one of my coworkers, she just said, she goes, half of my clothes has been collecting dust for two years. I haven't even been able to put it on, right? Totally. I actually have just started to go to the office and it's yeah. like nerve wracking because I'm like, am I in fashion? TikTok tells me no. Like, I don't even know because like all my work clothes is from like, two years ago and I'm like I don't think it's a vibe anymore I don't well, know what to do you, what would it be like now if you had to go back and maybe you're doing it right now and go to the office like five days a week I don't it just seems do it. so foreign now I mean I do it all the time yes. I've been doing it since the beginning of COVID I've yeah. still been going in but I think that made you feel like you had a routine because I felt like it was Groundhog Day like every especially when you work by yourself you're like every day is the same day I'm just hanging yeah. out with myself I make my morning coffee yeah I mean I didn't I didn't mind it but I would much rather work from home like that's what I feel like but the you goal don't get like me. the water cooler talk that's one of the things I'm good that I, I don't need the water cooler virtual. talk I what like, I need the gossip I the tea need, I don't need the gossip I'm good I like a little it. bit of tea I don't know that's, isn't that like the point of working is like you have a little bit of gossip yeah but I'm just, you know, I'm not that social. I just feel like, you know what, you just handle it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Both of you, that's perfect proof to what I said before, right? If both of you are like team members, yeah. what you value and what you value is different. Are so different, by, yeah. you know, oh, we're a tech company. Let's go do X, Y, and Z across the board. It's not going to work for everyone, right? So individualizing it because so whatever is important to one person, yeah, not to somebody else. Yeah, it's not like a one size fits all. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's true. Like everyone kind of like ideally if you get like the right people in the door like they do just want to do a good job like no one wants to be bad at their job so like yeah. as long as like they feel empowered to do a good job and you give them kind of like a healthy work environment then they should stay i guess hopefully hopefully yeah. right yes so that leads us to the next question have you ever fired someone i've only had to do it a couple of times and those are never comfortable conversations and you know I am someone that you know cares about people and like you know and I always think you don't know what someone's personal situation is and how important that job is what their what their their financial or their family situation is and it's not easy but I'm a big believer of a couple different things number one I do not believe that someone should ever be blindsided right. so what that so means like a performance improvement it's plan just basically or... you got to make sure that you're having regular conversations and especially when you're in a leadership role you have a responsibility to be engaging with your employees regularly, having conversation, what's working, what's not, coaching, developing. And sometimes mm -hmm. that can work, but sometimes it, sometimes it may not, right? And I believe if you kind of go through and you ask them, how are things going? Do you think things are going well at work? Are you enjoying it or not? And that opens the door to have more free-flowing conversation that may lead to a point where unfortunately if it's not working to say like, look, we've been having cars, we've been trying for a long time. You know, unfortunately, it's not working from whatever, a fit person, et cetera. And the person doesn't feel like, well, what do you mean? Yeah. I thought I was doing a good job all along, right. right? That's what you really want to avoid. And my big thing is, is like, okay, just because it doesn't work at one spot, what can you do during that time that you're working and, and coaching and hopefully developing them that supports them to land that next role, right? And I think if you can, it's a fine balance. And sometimes your hands may be tied and there may be just something glaringly bad that they do. That just like, you know what, we can't continue. But my big thing is, it's like, A, don't blindside people. Right. Number two is just like work with them and see and give people an opportunity because people's learning and how they work and how they develop, it's different. What if they're just not getting it though? And it's been like two months. Well, that's what he's saying. Then they're just not the right fit. 
But I think I think to that point is like you gotta have regular meetings and just say like you know we've tried let's try a different approach and eventually we get to a certain point it's like look we you know on this one area we've tried it's it's not working yeah. and and unfortunately you know for us you know and and yourself you know maybe this could better fit somewhere else and and I think that conversation only can happen if you've spent the time and you're having that conversation. If you don't, then that's where issues and challenges can come up. Where you know, terminating somebody can become a difficult conversation or a process. Have you ever had someone like quit like very flamboyantly? Like they were just like, I'm done and like left or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, really? One of my first roles, this was really going back like 15 years ago. Someone walked in and basically, you know, profanity said, blah, 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 this place, I'm done and just threw their pass on the table, made a big scene and, and walked out. And, you know, for someone that's really grown up with, you know, family members that have dealt with mental health issues, what I tell people is don't judge the act. Think about what might have happened five minutes, five days, five months before. There could be something else going on. So remain calm and basically, you know, don't make it, you know, uh, a situation where that person may become further agitated and then follow up and just see because there could be other things going on. And I think... You know, that that level of care in, in today's society, um, I, I think we can always do a, a yeah, little like bit empathy more. Is empathy is hundred percent. And and I think that's the, the best way to manage it because that's an uncontrollable thing. People are gonna do what they what they're gonna do and uh, what you don't wanna do. And I'm also a big believer of talk to your team right away, because what you don't wanna have happen is like that negative gossip and talk yeah, about like, right. oh, did you see what happened? And just get your team together and saying, like, you know what, we don't know what the situation is. And I think when you do and you set that context. It avoids by saying nothing. People saying, "Oh my God, did you see what happened?" Mm. I can't believe it. Like you know that that doesn't help out like society in yeah. terms of of, the, of what's going on because you never know what's going on in someone's life. Yeah. No, so office fair. politics between two people. How would you handle something like that, or like in a group? Yeah. Like, like I guess know, just bring the team together. Like I, I I think you know human nature and and, and the way that, you know things are is conflict will come up. It's inevitable, yeah. right? It's not that conflict comes up and people have disagreements. It's how it's handled. And does it foster a positive work environment? Does it foster a positive relationship between the individuals? And not even the individuals that are in it, the, the people that are surrounding, because it can have negative impacts as well. So once again, think about having open and honest conversation, bring the individuals together. Let's agree to disagree, but how do we move on and not have resentment build up because it's right. not being addressed and managed is what I would say on that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then do, when you're building a team, like, do you use anything like Enneagram or like Meyer Briggs to like make sure you're like, oh, I have like one architect or like, you know, like mesh the personalities yeah, together? I've, I, you, I, I, I've I gone feel like you're so many of those like, from like, yes. there's like, there's DISC, there's the color wheel, there's yeah. Meyer Briggs, personal tests, you know. I, I'm less about having, you know, you know, someone that's basically an introvert versus an extrovert, mm-hmm. sensory versus judgment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Et cetera. I think it's more about, I think those are, are interesting exercises to go through to understand who am I as an individual and more so how do I interact with people that may be different than myself, yeah. right? I think mm-hmm. that's what's important of I mean, these tests. So I think from time to time, um, those are cool as team building events. But yeah. if I were to do it, I would basically not focus time on where people are. It's about, you know, generally speaking, we have a majority of us that are on, on this type of personality type. Yeah. Let's be aware of where challenger issues can kind of and how we're going to work around that. But instead of doing those, I'm a big believer of bringing the team together and, you know, understanding what do you like to work on? What do you not like to work on? What do you work well under pressure or not? And then how do you gel the team together? So that's, that they're that's in the more right role. real versus just like, you no know, doing these assessments. Right. Um, because sometimes people just be like, I wonder what answer I should or give. Or like their best self. Yeah. Yes, 100%. Yeah. No, that's so fair. I've done some for like, jo- like I've applied for a lot of jobs. Something I don't <laughs> excel at. I like don't interview well, but I'm okay. Like on paper, I'm good at like, like I need time to think and like organize everything, but like in an interview I freeze and I like can't think of any examples and then I'm the worst at like advocating for myself and I love to use a we and it's a we is always just me, but I'll be like we as a team and I'll be like, oh, I should just say that I did it because I did it by myself. But like I feel like it's too arrogant to say me all the time because it's like it is literally yeah. just talking about yourself, but I hate that. It just like feels so unnatural to me. 
It's interesting that you bring that up because I think that can happen for a lot of people where you can do all the preparation and on paper, if I just had to basically use this medium or approach, I come across a certain way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like for a lot of like, you know, my coworker friends, like on our team, when we got to roll out things company wide, I'm very comfortable with public speaking. So my yeah. team members are not right. So I'm about, you know, if you're open about it and that's a dangerous approach, people think like, what I really say to this, be like, you know, I, I really have prepared well. But, you know, this um, type of format and interviewing with, you know, five people, yeah. it's causing myself. And when you do that, you know, they, they you'd be surprised. They may come back to you and say, okay, maybe we'll ask the question in a way that makes you may feel more comfortable mm -hmm. that allows you to demonstrate that, right? So I'm a big believer, always be your authentic self, show that. And employers, they're going to respect that because what they're going to say is this person has self-awareness. Right, self-awareness yeah. is very important. <laughs> yes. And um, you'd be surprised. But, uh, you know, when I've had that come up for me, I try to do a different format to really understand because still that person could be a strong team member for you. Mm -hmm. It may be just one aspect uh, that they're not comfortable with. Totally. No. And like nerves kind of get the best of you. And I'm yeah. a fast talker, but I'm yeah. aware that I'm a fast talker. But then sometimes I'll feel, especially virtual interviews, I feel like are a little harder because they're just like staring at you and it's not as conversational. So you're just like, and then you're like, okay, I'll just keep talking forever a mile a minute till you tell me to stop. Like, you're, and it's like hard to like rebut and just like be like, okay, they're just, it's virtual. So they're not going to talk to me. Like it's not. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you're like, this is funny. And they're like not laughing because they're on mute. So you're like, oh, okay, cool. Cool, cool. It's just like not landing. Um, yeah. So I think like in your work life, like is there like certain like passion projects or initiatives that like you've been working on that you want to like highlight? Yeah, sure. So um, we just wrapped up four weeks of Mental Health Month at Hootsuite. That's, so cool. that's something that's, you know, super near and dear to my heart. Um, four years ago, actually this May long weekend, my best friend Justin committed suicide and that was probably one of the most difficult things that I went through. And, mm -hmm. and it really, it really changed my perspective on things, right? Because before that, you know, when you look at, you know, people on the street or at the workplace that may be like quieter, maybe angry, it's easy for us to make judgments yeah. right. through our own perspective and narratives, right? So it really flipped on its head that when I'm in any organization, just because in HR, I happen to work in compensation and benefits and mm -hmm. mental health offerings usually as part of your benefits offering is, is that keep that at the forefront because people's mental health is something that may be explicitly shown or it may not, right? So what we did at Hootsuite in this past month is we put out a month-long series of webinars, resources. We actually did Q&As of lived experiences of individuals sharing their own mental health stories. Oh, and the engagement that we got through Slack or internal communication channels yeah. of, you know, a couple of the employees and myself actually sharing our stories yeah. on mental health and how it impacted work huge engagement and it really demonstrated so happy to be working at Hootsuite organization that puts mental health on the forefront um so like what we're going to do coming out of that is we're actually going to building out a brand new wellness program and initiative oh, okay. and what we want to be able to do before the end of the year is a couple of key things the first is that we want to offer a mental aid first aid course for all uh managers oh. across the companies we voluntary but we think you know managers are equipped with some basic tools yes. that they can look for or they you know if a mental health issue comes up with employees they're going to be better equipped right. it's part of our investment um, into the health and well-being of our employees I love and secondarily that. that what we want to be able to do is come up with some type of wellness manifesto that who's we can stand behind and hopefully by the end of the year bring that forward to the senior leadership team and get their endorsement that helps to to, to set the forefront that wellness is something that we will value the organization. So I think that's something that's really passionate because of awesome. personal experience that I'm trying to bring into the uh, my work life as well. Yeah, that's so no, cool. No, that's so good. No, I appreciate that. <laughs> even though you don't work in <laughs> You know, I don't even work there, but I mean, I would hope like more companies do that. Yeah, I, I think it's something that's really important and it's easy to just talk about mental health, but what are you actually gonna do about, do about it, it to yeah. support individuals that may be on a wide spectrum Mm -hmm. of of how they feel in terms of their own mental health and well-being yeah i think like hr has like totally evolved to like um my work has so many like clubs now too yeah. like they have like jedi which is like basically like just all about like inclusion and stuff so there's like yes. so many kind of like initiatives and like it's a book club so you like read different books about and it's like everything from like being on the spectrum to just like in like inclusion with like if you're um 
like parallel, like what do you call it when you're in a wheelchair? Parallel? Like accessibility? I don't know. But yeah, it's just like kind of covers everything, which is really yeah. good. Cause like I personally am not like that well versed in like any of those topics. And it's just like, it's always going to be like learning basically. Like you can't know it all, but yeah. Anything else you feel like you want to cover, Vanessa? Mm, no. <laughs> I know. I'm, everything. You're ready no, to revamp your resume. I'm, I'm, yeah. And nail your res- and nail your interview. Lots of thoughts, right? Lots of thoughts. Yeah. Yes. No, um, nothing that I can think of, right? When you're both staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> is the pressure getting? No pressure. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> oh man, is there anything else that you would want, like, if you were to give someone, like? like your top tips or tricks like what would you say if they're like looking for a new job or like expanding their skill set what's kind of like the things that they should keep top of mind yeah i think two things jump out number one is try to have as much clarity on what you really want right because it's it's easy to fall in that trap of like oh there's a cool company or oh i think this job's gonna pay me you know the money that i want Mm -hmm. i think once you're really clear on you know what what drives job satisfaction for you what makes you happy you're ultimately going to perform better you're ultimately going to be more happier in that role and i think that's a journey for some people they can figure that out really quickly mm-hmm. for other people it could be you know i have to go through and try different things well that's my my second piece is like be open to doing different things you never know when you're going to stumble upon something that you really enjoy and you like yeah. versus like i've got my mind set on i want to do x and i'm going to going to do x only and and only look for opportunities to, to do that, you may be missing out something else that you like. And mm-hmm. the second thing is, and, and I really wanted to mention this before in terms of, you know, what you can do in terms of the conversation about pay is there's because I've met with a really good friend of mine, Jillian Climey, who works in compensation. She started a company called The Thoughtful Co. Mm-hmm. What she does, she helps women negotiate compensation. Oh. And it's, 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 it, and we met yesterday, we had a coffee, actually five minutes away from here at Milano Coffee yesterday. And, you know, she used to do a similar job to me, left, started her own business, and was really passionate about supporting women and That's negotiating awesome. pay because there's, there's a lot of biases that when it comes to like compensation data and how companies pay traditionally filled roles by females versus males right. and how males maybe negotiate different than females, yeah. right? So yeah. she really helps um, individuals understand, you know, when you're going into the job offer phase, understanding, you know, like what are the different components and, and how to negotiate. I, I definitely think that's something that's super important that I would recommend. Obviously, the, the both of you are are females, so I just thought I would bring that no, up. That's, that's awesome. something you should definitely... Uh, check out and engage with her on on linkedin and because you know that as a future guest i think maybe uh someone you really want yeah. to speak to yeah yeah no for sure hopefully, no, she'll, hopefully she'll be okay with me uh <laughs> saying this without even <laughs> talking to her about it yes i just met with her yesterday and just thought in the conversation um yeah, negotiation no. is, is something that's you know maybe daunting for some individuals like do i just take what they're offering because i'm just happy to get a job and right. really she helps you understand like know your worth know your value exactly totally. like goes back to value and and understanding oh you know if it's like a tech company that's going to give me like you know equity in the company and they're 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 a private company what does that mean is there any value in that or not etc yeah. like and how do i negotiate if i think i deserve you know a higher base salary and she provides a, a lot of great tips and and uh, i think definitely uh worthwhile checking out yeah yeah definitely. i always get scared i actually just recently got a new job and that was something that was like really daunting is like negotiating back and forth and what's really funny is i asked my dad and he was like just be happy you got the job well, there you go the first offer and i was yeah. like what this is like <laughs> no. the opposite of like ev- yeah. what everyone else that's tells like something you. my parents would say um, yeah. yeah. And then like even going back and forth, I felt like so nervous. And then my coworker told me a story about how she lost a job because she was too aggressive in the negotiation that they told her that they didn't feel like she wanted it. And so it was like, how do I find the balance? And like I went in, I did get what I wanted, like exactly what I wanted. But I was like, oh, I should have gone for more because like I think it would have I don't know, it would have been better. But oh. yeah, I'll definitely uh, I'll link both of you to to Jillian. I think that'd be a. a interesting person to have a conversation totally, with yeah. and uh yeah she's doing a, a lot of great work in the space and it's great to see right you know someone that's been working in compensation and just seeing like in terms of you know topics that are hot these days like pay equity mm-hmm. that's a huge thing for companies right now and uh, obviously looking at underrepresented groups from a DEI perspective and and how you set your pay um etc so uh yeah, totally. I, I definitely think uh that's really a, an important area and that i'm passionate about as well in terms of 
you know, fair pay yeah, and ensuring right. that uh, every individual that comes in, they should understand the different components of the package our company is offering. And, and like, to your point, know your value and really be able to, to fight for it because it's so important to get that compensation set correctly from when you walk in versus like, I'll just take this, I'll show my strength. Because and then like other expect to raise later. Because like, yeah. other factors can come up that may have nothing to do with the great work that you're doing that may handcuff the company from from increasing your pay later totally. on. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming. We really yeah, appreciate thank it. Well, we thank feel you like both. we've learned it's so been much. Awesome. Vanessa is finally going to get a LinkedIn. I know. I'm going to get a LinkedIn. And a LinkedIn new job. Oh my god. It's all about just starting small steps like because yeah. that's the the hardest hurdle to get over. Like, I think first I'm just step. like nervous people would just see like my history. I don't know. Your job it, history is that weird? Feels private to you? I don't know. It's that weird. Oh my god. I, guess I it's do. A bit weird. I have seen on LinkedIn like someone who's like a <laughs> wedding photo and I was like, "Oh, it's just like it makes you feel like they just like don't get it." Like I don't know if that's too judgy of me, but I'm like, "Oh, it just seems like or if when people use LinkedIn like Facebook and you're like, "Oh, this is Yeah, weird. and I definitely think once again, know what that platform is for. Yeah. yeah. Because people they use it the right way and they use it the incorrect way, I guess there's no incorrect way, they use it a different way that may not serve your purpose on that platform. And I definitely do think, you know, I, I've learned as well. And I'll be honest with you, like I need to update my photo. It's just one of my own personal photos. Like actually like you do notice it's one of those things when you come across a well curated LinkedIn profile, that's got a really good headshot. It really does stand out. Right. right? And you know, we're, we're all fighting for like the same thing and so differentiation. That's yeah, what's going to be Yeah, you want to look memorable. like polished. How's my LinkedIn actually? Sorry, I, th- I, I thought it was great actually. Oh, okay. I, I took a peek at it. I'm just like, I'm, and it, it triggered for me. I'm like, oh, I got to work on my LinkedIn and I got to get a better photo. Oh <laughs> See my, my LinkedIn. There's like nothing there. <laughs> I don't even think I've logged on. It's just in, like the gray in, I don't yeah. outline of a person. Yeah, I don't yeah. even know. Here's our suggestion. Even if you don't want to get started, just log in and just take a look at activity people yeah. are doing just to get an understanding for, your, you know, for a certain amount of time. It, it, it'll help you understand because I did that because like forever. I'm like, why don't everyone log into LinkedIn? Yeah, totally. Yeah. You're like, yeah. I already have a job. doesn't matter. I just don't <laughs> want to be judged. I don't know why. I think we're all, you know what? Well, you honestly. have control over what you put on there. I know, but I just, I don't know what it is. I have LinkedIn insecurity. <laughs> okay, we'll work on it together later. Oh, man. Start small, start small. Okay. Just my picture. Yes. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, we'll that's get a nice one. headshot that's step today. One. Yeah. Your hair looks good. I like yeah. the sweater, very professional. Yeah. yeah we can <laughs> Andrew said I look perfect, so... There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and if people want to like find or do you want a call to action, like for people to. Oh, like, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if people want to find more about you or reach out to you with their HR questions, like where's the best place to reach you? Uh, they can reach out to me on, on my LinkedIn. Just put in Paul Dylan Hootsuite <laughs> and, and I will come up. That's the best way. And looking forward to uh, interacting with any uh, audience members, whoever wants to have more conversation with the top Join the today. Team. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we're definitely always uh, on the on the lookout for, for great talent and individuals to join a, a great startup company in Vancouver that's uh, had a lot of success. Yeah, awesome. Well, awesome. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Really enjoyed this.